Obrigado, and uh, for the same shared sentiments that I, I have. Um, and, and since I don't know how many people may have been at a talk I gave yesterday in, at uh, Embrapa, I, 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 it's a completely different talk, only with similar methods. So I, I know at least uh, uh, Kawe and Professor Helmut Eckert were, were there, and so this is uh, intended to be a, well, very interesting science on the materials, I think. I hope you will agree. And also with very nice examples of some of the skills that we have in solid state and MR spectroscopy that I think complement those that I've seen today and available here in this fantastic facility here in the, in the University of, Federal University of San Carlos. Because what Santa Barbara, University of Santa Barbara, California, Santa Barbara, has that is quite unusual in the United States is that you have a series of central common experimental characterization facilities. We have electron microscopy, we have X-ray diffraction, atomic force microscopy, many other types, including NMR. And so what, what I was really quite surprised and comfortable to see here at the university is you have this common culture of, of, of facilities which gives you great power to, and to work on things across disciplines if in a sense of cooperation. And that's the culture at UCSB, so I find it very compatible. And uh, this would be a, you'll find this part similar if, um, if you, when you visit Santa Barbara. So I'm gonna speak, I, I, I'm accustomed to speaking to broad audiences, and so I'm expecting that there's only a few maybe NMR experts, but in that case, some of the techniques will be interesting to you, those of you, but they'll be also hopefully interesting from those of you who have interest in inorganic chemistry, colloid chemistry, materials chemistry, and, um, and hybrid type materials where there's both an inorganic and organic. And the topic I've got, I'd like to talk about is one of the things I'm, I think is quite exciting from the material science. And we've been working in zeolite catalysts for a long time, also with surfactants and mesoporous materials. Probably that's what we're most maybe um, recognized for. And there's been some very recent progress on the using the combination to get mesostructured zeolite type materials. These are really interesting for heterogeneous catalysis. And, and so what they're interesting for is because you have, uh, these are the crystal structures. So this is a scanning electron microscope. And so these materials have pores which are relatively large for easy access of large molecules. They're formed by a combination of surfactants and zeolite templating agents to get easy mass transport for big molecules which are not usually possible to react with zeolites. And, the, and if there's time, depending, I will try to talk, and so this is where the combination of surfactants comes in, and, the, and I'm gonna talk about cement, because these are aluminosilicates, and cements are silicate aluminates. And they have very different properties, different, different applications, but at a molecular level, they're almost the same. And that's what I want to talk to you. I'll, I'll sort of make that connection. And in both cases, there's an, they share a common physical aspect of understanding and controlling crystallization of these aluminosilicate, aluminate oxides in the presence of surfactants, or in this case, saccharides, which actually have amphiphilic character themselves. So at a molecular level, these two types of problems look very similar. And by the way, this is a project which is funded from Halliburton, and I thought this would be appropriate here in Brazil because it's particularly relevant for cements for deep water oil well applications that Petrobras is interested in. And so we've been working with Halliburton on this. So the common themes that these two types of materials share are aspects of self-assembly, crystallinity, and then how in the presence of additives like surfactants and saccharides, how or molecular order develops or doesn't because of the interactions with the surfactants or the saccharides at the surfaces of these oxides. That means we have to understand at a molecular level the structures of these semi-crystalline materials and often in the case of coupled simultaneously self-assembly and crystallization processes and then the influences that adsorb species, the surfactants or saccharides or other organics or solvents have 
on these processes. And then we're in the chemical engineering department interested in the influences on the macroscopic material properties. And I'd say if there's any questions, we're a nice, very nice sized group. So if you have questions during my talk, I'm happy to take them in the, in the middle and not waiting to the end. So here is the, um, here is the, uh, the kind of overarching interest. And, and, and actually yesterday, I, I spoke, so we have a broad interest in inorganic organic hybrid materials. And these include things I talked about yesterday were semiconductor nanocrystals, surfactant directed oxide, supported metal clusters. So these are all nanoscale crystals of a few nanometers. I spoke also a bit about our work on photoresponsive materials with hybrid organic photovoltaic systems. And, and today, I'm going to talk about catalytic materials, in this case, zeolite nucleation and growth, and structural materials, these cement materials. But we have interest in, in, in all of these different subtopics. What I'm not going to talk about, and I know from talking to Emerson also today, that we have, there's a strong interest in electrochemical systems, and we have a very large effort in fuel cell membranes, electrocatalysts, and supercapacitors, all of which have aspects at a molecular level the common molecular properties of using organic molecules together with inorganic components to form structures that you can together form that are not possible separately. So here's the processes we seek to measure and understand for these materials. Solvent interactions are, are important, such as water or alcohol or hydrophobic so, uh, solvents. How an inorganic species forms in different ions in solution. Silicates and aluminates are very diverse in sol gel chemistry. Very, very complex speciation uh, in solution to different ion species. How surfactant to self-assembly occurs. When the inorganic cross-links, you can have precipitation of the, of, into a amorphous or a crystalline type solid, which nucleates and grows. The domains of those growths into larger crystals or in liquid crystal-like domains occurs. And all of these, how the influences of interfaces or modifiers, such as surfactants, organocations, fluoride, biomolecules, other functional gas species, can contribute to influencing these processes which happen simultaneously and often are coupled. And the ones I'm going to talk about mostly today are these ones in red. Surfactant self-assembly, nucleation and crystallization, and the influences of these interfaces and modifiers. So our approach is in my group, uh, we use a combination of synthesis because all of the materials we make in our group, we synthesize ourselves. That's an advantage when you're doing material science. We're not relying on other people to synthesize our materials for us. And the reason why this is so important is because when we characterize them, using things like especially nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is our principal tool, is an X-ray diffraction, electron microscopy, vibrational spectroscopy, and these various calculations of density functional theory or macroscopic property measurements. All of these are different length scales, are complementary, but in order to really understand the materials, we have to test our hypothesis. And to do this, often we need to modify the synthesis, sometimes isotopically enrich the materials, and this gives us an opportunity to test our understanding, and in doing this synthesis, characterization, and the modeling, we can understand and thereby achieve our goal of influencing the macroscopic properties. So I showed a slide like this yesterday, but I think for an audience, it's, it's a really helpful one to see, what, understand the kind of information we're going to look at. So from the chemistry community, the small molecule or solution phase, which you have a lot of here in Sao Carlos, is the chemical shift. And the chemical shift that we'll be interested in, especially in the case of silicon, silicon 29 has a natural abundance of 4.7%. So it's very similar in properties to carbon, carbon 13. So if you've used carbon 13 NMR, you're familiar, you, you have a lot of the, the intuition about silicon. It's also four valent, so there's four bonds it typically forms. And this is central to the valence electrons in the local bonding environment that, you're, that allows it to be diagnostic of the type of, of carbon or the type of silicon-29 that is reflected in the chemical shift. We're also going to use dipole-dipole couplings, which are through space interactions between different nuclear spins. So it could be a silicon-29 with a hydrogen, which influences the local magnetic environment. That is, has a dependence of about a cube of the inverse dimension, so it's very molecular, or typically approximately one nanometer, sometimes less. 
It's distance and mobility dependent because it can average this distance by molecular mobility. And we also can use this to look at dipole couplings between silicon-29 spins, although the pro protons we'll use more, more frequently for this case. J couplings is very powerful in the sense that it's used for, and as is dipole interactions, for protein structures. So one of the things that have has led to the, the whole uh, strength of NMR in protein science and the structure determination of biomolecules is the use of these J couplings, which are through covalent bond. That is, they will take and look at the interactions between, say, silicon-29 or protons or, or carbon-13, but through chemical bonds and st and, 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 uh, in, rather than in through space. So this is through bond. This is through space. They're different. The J couplings are much weaker. And we've just had a nice paper published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, which, which uses these J couplings to use now to determine the structures of these molecules, which in inorganic frameworks has not really previously been done. So, and it relies on the use, in this case, of isotopic enrichment at, at small levels, at least, of, to get silicon-29 nuclei pairs so that we can establish what the J couplings of these nuclei actually are. And then for aluminum, which I'll talk about, is as a quadrupole nuclei, and that presents some additional complexity, but we'll, I'll say a little bit about that if we talk about the cements. But for now, we're going to be looking principally then at silicon-29, aluminum-27, hydrogen, and carbon-13 in these systems for these kinds of studies, for these molecular studies. Now, this is, uh, when I talk about zeolites and mesostructured zeolites, here was the state of the art until about two years ago. Zeolites are formed from organic molecules, and they form these nice crystalline materials, which have these topologies, which are very complicated. And they, they establish these topologies from looking at the long-range atomic order that is manifested by the intensity and the positions of these X-ray diffraction lines when you have a crystalline solid. So this is a polycrystalline material. An X-ray diffraction shows that this has material, material has long-range atomic order in its lattice. And it's manifested as well by the narrow silicon-29 cross-polarization magic angle spinning NMR spectra, where you have very small lines of narrow lines of 0 0.7 ppm, that's 0 0.7 hertz per megahertz, uh, of the, which shows three distinct silicon, distinct silicon sites in this complex structure. So, this is local atomic order because it's very well defined and narrow, and long range atomic order because of the nice crystalline framework. The comparison to mesoporous solids, which was discovered by Mobile uh, and co Jeff Beck and Charlie Kresge and co workers in the late, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, is really a liquid crystal like framework. So we've worked in this field since I arrived at UC Santa Barbara. And that's interesting because if you look at the mesoporous materials, it's used as surfactant. And you see no high angle scattering. So these, in an atomic sense, are not crystalline orders in this way. So there's no high angle scattering. But you do see a nice, very nice reflections at small angle, similar to the, which allows you to say that you have long range mesoscopic ordering, but not atomic order. And this absence of atomic order out here is because the walls of these liquid crystal type mesoporous materials are amorphous, like silica glass. And the silica glass has, is, has a poor atomic order, and it's manifested in this large, much broader peaks, which compared to the local order of the crystalline solid are approximately an order of magnitude broader. And this is the signature of a very broad distribution of silicon environments, which shows that this is disordered that's atomically ordered, and this is the way the materials were known up until a couple of years ago. And the problem is that this, these materials are outstanding catalysts. They're used in fluidized bed catalytic cracking, many very important industrial uh, applications. And these, they have much larger pores, yeah, 10 nanometers versus, say, less than, less than a nanometer. These have very easy mass, good mass transfer properties, but they're amorphous, even with the loom. And these have poor catalytic properties. So it was a big effort for 20 years or more to try to somehow combine the catalytic activities of these zeolites, which in the case of this very important one, ZSM5, is a, used for methanol to gasoline. It 
It's a very important one, even becoming more important with the availability of inexpensive natural gas. Has 0 0.5 nanometer pores, but because the pores are very small, it has mass transport limitations. S big mo molecules ha cannot penetrate and diffuse into these tiny pores. So this is high catalytic activities, but poor mass transport. The SBA type materials, which we, was discovered at Santa Barbara with Galen Stuckey and my group, uh, were mesoporous in the sense they have these much larger pores of up to 10 to 12 nanometers. They have, as I mentioned, excellent mass transport properties, but typically low catalytic activities because the walls are amorphous. <laughs>